Guy Fawkes, 13 April, 1570, 31 January, 1606, also known as Guido Fawkes while fighting for the Spanish, was a member of a group of provincial English Catholics involved in the failed gunpowder plot of 1605. He was born and educated in York. His father died when Fox was eight years old, after which his mother married a recusant Catholic. Fox converted to Catholicism and left for mainland Europe, where he fought for Catholic Spain in the Eighty Years' War against Protestant Dutch reformers in the Low Countries. He traveled to Spain to seek support for a Catholic rebellion in England without success. He later met Thomas Wintour, with whom he returned to England. Wintour introduced him to Robert Catesby, who planned to assassinate King James I and restore a Catholic monarch to the throne. The plotters leased an undercroft beneath the House of Lords. Fox was placed in charge of the gunpowder that they stockpiled there. The authorities were prompted by an anonymous letter to search Westminster Palace during the early hours of 5 November, and they found Fox guarding the explosives. He was questioned and tortured over the next few days and confessed to wanting to blow up the House of Lords. Fox was sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. However, at his execution on 31 January, he died when his neck was broken as he was hanged, with some sources claiming that he deliberately jumped to make this happen. He thus avoided the agony of his sentence. He became synonymous with the gunpowder plot, the failure of which has been commemorated in the UK as Guy Fawkes Knight since 5 November 1605, when his effigy is traditionally burned on a bonfire, commonly accompanied by fireworks. Guy Fawkes was born in 1570 in Stonegate, York. He was the second of four children born to Edward Fox, a proctor and an advocate of the consistory court at York and his wife Edith. Guy's parents were regular communicants of the Church of England, as were his paternal grandparents. His grandmother, born Ellen Harrington, was the daughter of a prominent merchant who served as Lord Mayor of York in 1536. Guy's mother's family were recusant Catholics, and his cousin, Richard Cowling, became a Jesuit priest. Guy was an uncommon name in England, but may have been popular in York on account of a local notable, Sir Guy Fairfax of Steeton. The date of Fox's birth is unknown, but he was baptized in the church of St. Michael Lee Belfry, York, on 16 April. As the customary gap between birth and baptism was three days, he was probably born about 13 April. In 1568, Edith had given birth to a daughter named Anne, but the child died aged about seven weeks. In November that year, she bore two more children after Guy, Anne B. 1572 and Elizabeth B. 1575. Both were married in 1599 and 1594 respectively in 1579. When Guy was eight years old, his father died. His mother remarried several years later to the Catholic Dianus Bainbrig, or Dennis Bainbridge, of Scotton, Harrogate. Fox may have become a Catholic through the Bainbrig family's recusant tendencies, and also the Catholic branches of the Pullian and Percy families of Scotton, but also from his time at St. Peter's School in York. A governor of the school had spent about 20 years in prison for recusancy, and its headmaster, John Pullen, came from a family of noted Yorkshire recusants, the Pullians of Blubberhouses. In her 1915 work, The Pullianas of Yorkshire, author Catherine Pullen suggested that Fox's Catholic education came from his Harrington relatives, who were known for harboring priests, one of whom later accompanied Fox to Flanders in 1592-1593. Fox's fellow students included John Wright and his brother Christopher, both later involved with Fox in the gunpowder plot, and Oswald Tessiman, Edward Oldcorn, and Robert Middleton, who became priests, the latter executed in 1601. After leaving school, Fox entered the service of Anthony Brown, first Viscount Montague. The Viscount took a dislike to Fox and, after a short time, dismissed him. He was subsequently employed by Anthony Maria Brown, 2nd Viscount Montagu, who succeeded his grandfather at the age of 18. At least one source claims that Fox married and had a son, but no known contemporary accounts confirm this. In October 1590, one Fox sold the estate in Clifton in York that he had inherited from his father. He traveled to the continent to fight in the Eighty Years' War for Catholic Spain against the new Dutch Republic, and from 1595 until the Peace of Irvins in 1595 until the Peace of Irvins in 1598, France, 
Although England was not by then engaged in land operations against Spain, the two countries were still at war, and the Spanish Armada of 1588 was only five years in the past. He joined Sir William Stanley, an English Catholic and veteran commander in his mid-forties, who had raised an army in Ireland to fight in Leicester's expedition to the Netherlands. Stanley had been held in high regard by Elizabeth I, but following his surrender of Deventer to the Spanish in 1580, seven he and most of his troops had switched sides to serve Spain. Fox became an Alferez or junior officer, fought well at the Siege of Calais in 1596, and by 1603 had been recommended for a captaincy. That year, he traveled to Spain to seek support for a Catholic rebellion in England. He used the occasion to adopt the Italian version of his name, Guido, and in his memorandum described James I, who became King of England that year, as a heretic who intended to have all of the Papist sect driven out of England. He denounced Scotland and the King's favorites among the Scottish nobles, writing it will not be possible to reconcile these two nations as they are for very long. Although he was received politely, the court of Philip III was unwilling to offer him any support. In 1604, Fox became involved with a small group of English Catholics led by Robert Catesby, who planned to assassinate the Protestant King James and replace him with his daughter, third in the line of succession, Princess Elizabeth. Fox was described by the Jesuit priest and former school friend Oswald Tessamond as pleasant of approach and cheerful of manner, opposed to quarrels and strife, loyal to his friends. Tessamond also claimed Fox was a man highly skilled in matters of war, and that it was this mixture of piety and professionalism that endeared him to his fellow conspirators. The author Antonia Fraser describes Fox as a tall, powerfully built man with thick reddish-brown hair, a flowing mustache in the tradition of the time, and a bushy reddish-brown beard, and a bushy reddish-brown beard, and that he was a man of action, capable of intelligent argument as well as physical endurance somewhat to the surprise of his enemies. The first meeting of the five central conspirators took place on Sunday 20 May 1604 at an inn called the Duck and Drake in the fashionable Strand District of London. Catesby had already proposed at an earlier meeting with Thomas Wintour and John Wright to kill the king and his government by blowing up the Parliament House with gunpowder. Wintour, who at first objected to the plan, was convinced by Catesby to travel to the continent to seek help. Wintour met with the constable of Castile, the exiled Welsh spy, Hugh Owen, and Sir William Stanley, who said that Catesby would receive no support from Spain. Owen did, however, introduce Wintour to Fox, who had by then been away from England for many years, and thus was largely unknown in the country. Wintour and Fox were contemporaries. Each was militant and had first-hand experience of the unwillingness of the Spaniards to help. Wintour told Fox of their plan to do somewhat in England if the peace with Spain helped us not, and thus in April 1604 the two men returned to England. Wintour's news did not surprise Catesby. Despite positive noises from the Spanish authorities, he feared that the deeds would not answer. One of the conspirators, Thomas Percy, was appointed a gentleman pensioner in June 1604, gaining access to a house in London that belonged to John Winard, keeper of the king's wardrobe. Fox was installed as a caretaker and began using the pseudonym John Johnson, servant to Percy. The contemporaneous account of the prosecution, taken from Thomas Wintour's confession, claimed that the conspirators attempted to dig a tunnel from beneath Winyard's house to Parliament, although this story may have been a government fabrication. No evidence for the existence of a tunnel was presented by the prosecution and no trace of one has ever been found. Fox himself did not admit the existence of such a scheme until his fifth interrogation, but even then he could not locate the tunnel. If the story is true, however, by December 1604, the conspirators were busy tunneling from their rented house to the House of Lords. They ceased their efforts when, during tunneling, they heard a noise from above. Fox was sent out to investigate and returned with the news that the tenant's widow was clearing out a nearby undercroft, directly beneath the House of Lords, the plotters purchased the lease to the room, which also belonged to John Winyard. Unused and filthy, it was considered an ideal hiding place for the gunpowder the plotters planned to store. 
According to Fox, 20 barrels of gunpowder were brought in at first, followed by 16 more on 20 July. On 28 July, however, the ever-present threat of the plague delayed the opening of Parliament until Tuesday, 5 November. In an attempt to gain foreign support, in May 1605, Fox traveled overseas and informed Hugh Owen of the plotter's plan. At some point during this trip, his name made its way into the files of Robert Cecil, 1st Earl of Salisbury, who employed a network of spies across Europe. One of these spies, Captain William Turner, may have been responsible, although the information he provided to Salisbury usually amounted to no more than a vague pattern of invasion reports and included nothing which regarded the gunpowder plot. On 20, 1 April, he told how Fox was to be brought by Tessaman to England. Fox was a well-known Flemish mercenary and would be introduced to Mr. Catesby and honorable friends of the nobility and others who would have arms and horses in readiness. Turner's report did not, however, mention Fox's pseudonym in England, John Johnson, and did not reach Cecil until late in November, well after the plot had been discovered. It is uncertain when Fox returned to England, but he was back in London by late August 1605, when he and Winter discovered that the gunpowder stored in the undercroft had decayed. More gunpowder was brought into the room, along with firewood to conceal it. Fox's final role in the plot was settled during a series of meetings in October. He was to light the fuse and then escape across the Thames. Simultaneously, a revolt in the Midlands would help to ensure the capture of Princess Elizabeth. Acts of regicide were frowned upon, and Fox would therefore head to the continent, where he would explain to the Catholic powers his holy duty to kill the king and his retinue. A few of the conspirators were concerned about fellow Catholics who would be present at Parliament during the opening. On the evening of 26 October, Lord Monteagle received an anonymous letter warning him to stay away and to retire yourself into your county once you are county once you may expect the event in safety for. They shall receive a terrible blow of this Parliament. Despite quickly becoming aware of the letter, informed by one of Monteagle's servants, the conspirators resolved to continue with their plans, as it appeared that it was clearly thought to be a hoax. Fox checked the undercroft on 30 October and reported that nothing had been disturbed. Monteagle's suspicions had been aroused, however, and the letter was shown to King James. The king ordered Sir Thomas Navet to conduct a search of the cellars underneath Parliament, which he did in the early hours of 5 November. Fox had taken up his station late on the previous night, armed with a slow match and a watch given to him by Percy, because he should know how the time went away. He was found leaving the cellar shortly after midnight and arrested. Inside, the barrels of gunpowder were discovered hidden under piles of firewood and coal. Fox gave his name as John Johnson and was first interrogated by members of the King's Privy Chamber, where he remained defiant. When asked by one of the lords what he was doing in possession of so much gunpowder, Fox answered that his intention was to blow you Scotch beggars back to your native mountains. He identified himself as a 36-year-old Catholic from Netherdale in Yorkshire and gave his father's name as Thomas and his mother's as Edith Jackson. Wounds on his body noted by his questioners he explained as the effects of pleurisy. Fox admitted his intention to blow up the House of Lords and expressed regret at his failure to do so. His steadfast manner earned him the admiration of King James, who described Fox as possessing a Roman resolution. James's admiration did not, however, prevent him from ordering on 6 November that John Johnson be tortured to reveal the names of his co-conspirators. He directed that the torture be light at first, referring to the use of manacles, but more severe if necessary, authorizing the use of the rack. The gentler tortures are to be first used unto him at sic per gratis at imitenditur, and so by degrees proceeding to the worst. Fox was transferred to the Tower of London. The king composed a list of questions to be put to Johnson such as, as to what he is, for I can never yet hear of any man that knows him when and where he learned to speak French, and if he was a papist, who brought him up in it. The room in which Fox was interrogated subsequently became known as the Guy Fox Room. Sir William Wayad, lieutenant of the Tower, supervised the torture and obtained Fox's confession. He searched his prisoner and found a letter addressed to Guy Fox. To Wyatt's surprise, Johnson remained silent, revealing nothing about the plot or its authors. On the night of 6 November, he spoke with Wad, 
who reported to Salisbury, he Johnson told us that since he undertook this action, he did every day pray to God he might perform that which might be for the advancement of the Catholic faith and saving his own soul. According to Wyatt, Fox managed to rest through the night, despite his being warned that he would be interrogated until I had gotten the inward secret of his thoughts and all his complices. His composure was broken at some point during the following day. The observer Sir Edward Hobby remarked since Johnson's being in the tower, he beginneth to speak English. Fox revealed his true identity on 7 November and told his interrogators that there were five people involved in the plot to kill the king. He began to reveal their names on 8 November and told how they intended to place Princess Elizabeth on the throne. His third confession on 9 November implicated Francis Tresham. Following the Ridolfi plot of 1571, prisoners were made to dictate their confessions before copying and signing them if they still could. Although it is uncertain if he was tortured on the rack, Fox's scrawled signature suggests the suffering he endured at the hands of his interrogators. The trial of eight of the plotters began on Monday 27 January 1606. Fox shared the barge from the tower to Westminster Hall with seven of his co-conspirators. They were kept in the Star Chamber before being taken to Westminster Hall, where they were displayed on a purpose-built scaffold. The king and his close family, watching in secret, were among the spectators as the Lord's Commissioners read out the list of charges. Fox was identified as Guido Fox, otherwise called Guido Johnson. He pleaded not guilty despite his apparent acceptance of guilt from the moment he was captured. The jury found all the defendants guilty, and the Lord Chief Justice, Sir John Popham, pronounced them guilty of high treason. The Attorney General, Sir Edward Coke, told the court that each of the condemned would be drawn backwards to his death by a horse, his head near the ground. They were to be put to death halfway between heaven and earth as unworthy of both. Their genitals would be cut off and burnt before their eyes, and their bowels and hearts removed. They would then be decapitated, and the dismembered parts of their bodies displayed so that they might become prey for the fowls of the air. Fox's and Tresham's testimony regarding the Spanish treason was read aloud as well as confessions related specifically to the gunpowder plot. The last piece of evidence offered was a conversation between Fox and Wintour, who had been kept in adjacent cells. The two men apparently thought they had been speaking in private, but their conversation was intercepted by a government spy. When the prisoners were allowed to speak, Fox explained his not guilty plea as ignorance of certain aspects of the indictment. On 31 January 1606, Fox and three others, Thomas Wintour, Ambrose Rookwood, and Robert Keyes, were dragged from the tower on waddled hurdles to the old palace yard. At Westminster, opposite the building they had attempted to destroy, his fellow plotters were then hanged and quartered. Fox was the last to stand on the scaffold. He asked for forgiveness of the king and state while keeping up his crosses and idol ceremonies, Catholic practices. Weakened by torture and aided by the hangman, Fox began to climb the ladder to the noose, but either through jumping to his death or climbing too high, so the rope was incorrectly set. He managed to avoid the agony of the latter part of his execution by breaking his neck. His lifeless body was nevertheless quartered, and, as was the custom, his body parts were then distributed to the four corners of the kingdom to be displayed as a warning to other would be traitors. On 5 November 1605, Londoners were encouraged to celebrate the king's escape from assassination by lighting bonfires, provided that this testimony of joy be careful done without any danger or disorder. An act of Parliament designated each 5 November as a day of thanksgiving for the joyful day of deliverance and remained in force until 1859. Fox was one of 13 conspirators, but he is the individual most associated with the plot. In Britain, 5 November has variously been called Guy Fox Night, Guy Fox Day, Plot Night, and Bonfire Night, which can be traced directly back to the original celebration of 5 November 1605. Bonfires were accompanied by fireworks from the 1650s onwards, and it became the custom after 1673 to burn an effigy, usually of the Pope when her presumptive James, Duke of York, converted to Catholicism. 
Effigies of other notable figures have found their way onto the bonfires, such as Paul Kruger, Margaret Thatcher, Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak, and Vladimir Putin. The guy is normally created by children from old clothes, newspapers, and a mask. During the 19th century, guy came to mean an oddly dressed person, while in many places it has lost any pejorative connotation and instead refers to any male person in the plural form can refer to people of any gender, as in you guys. James Sharpry, professor of history at the University of York, has described how Guy Fox came to be toasted as the last man to enter Parliament with honest intentions. William Harrison Ainsworth's 1841 historical romance Guy Fox or the gunpowder treason portrays Fox in a generally sympathetic light, and his novel transformed Fox in the public perception into an acceptable fictional character. Fox subsequently appeared as essentially an action hero in children's books and penny dreadfuls such as The Boyhood Days of Guy Fox, or The Conspirators of Old London, published around 1905. According to historian Lewis Call, Fox is now a major icon in modern political culture, whose face has become a potentially powerful instrument for the articulation of postmodern anarchism in the late 20th century.